that. Hello, is anybody there? Hello? Uh, we are now, now live. You can start now. Okay, as uh, can you see my the screen? Yes, yes, the screen is fine. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, this is Marshall Giller, the head of investment research here at FX Premise. Uh, today, I'm going to give you an introduction to the oil market. Uh, my goal in the, in this webinar is to allow you to understand the commodity, understand what moves its price, and give you my view uh, briefly on where the price is headed. So it's going to be an introduction to the oil market. First, we're going to talk about what is oil, what affects the supply of oil, what affects the demand for oil. Uh, and those are the two things that uh, affect the price, of course. And what data should we watch to find out uh, to get a hold of it? And uh, what expect? Also, discuss ex the role of expectations in forming the oil price. Finally, as I said, why I expect oil prices to fall from here. But first, I'd like to talk about why you should trade oil in the first place, uh, why you should be interested in this, uh, mainly for two reasons. First off, oil is extremely volatile. The price dropped 75 percent between June 2014 and February of 2016, only to rebound nearly 70 percent in the, the two months after that. On average, the price moves 4.7% every day. If you just take it between the low of the day and the high of the day, that's tremendous volatility. It compares with 1.1% 1 .1 trading range for dollar yen and less than 1% for euro dollar, as you can see on, on this slide, a much wider range. Secondly, oil offers an opportunity to diversify your trading. Financial theory says that by investing in uncorrelated assets, you can improve your return while reducing the variability of those returns. That is, reducing your risk. Higher return, lower risk. Maybe the only free lunch available in uh, the financial world. Of course, this won't work if you're trading currencies that are highly correlated with the price of oil, uh, but we'll get to that later. There are some currency pairs that are largely uncorrelated with oil, and those are the ones that I've listed here on this slide, uh, as you can see, very low correl cor correlations with them, with, with the price of oil. Uh, so let's start with a very brief discussion on the oil industry, how oil gets out from the ground to you. First, it's pumped out of the ground here, either on land or on the sea. Uh, then it gets moved by rail, by ship, or by pipeline to a central a storage terminal, a oil hub. Refineries then buy the oil and refine it into the products that we actually use, gasoline, fuel oil, asphalt, etc. Those are the things that we buy and that we know. These products get shipped to bulk storage terminals. Uh, from there, they get distributed to the retail outlets and eventually go into your car, go into your heater, go into whatever. So that's a very brief summary of the industry. Now, uh, if you're interested in buying or selling oil, what should you do? Oil isn't like gold. You can't just buy or sell oil like you can trade gold. Gold is an element. Uh, it's always the same once it's refined. Oil, on the other hand, differs depending on where it comes from. So the supply and demand for each type of oil is different, and so is the price. Each oil field produces a different kind of oil. So and each kind of oil can be refined into different amounts of the various petroleum products, such as gasoline, jet fuel, asphalt, or whatever. Now, each product sells for a different price. The price of each kind of oil, therefore, depends largely on the price of the products that it can be refined uh, from, that can be refined from it. This is referred to as the net back from the oil. Working backwards from what you can get from the oil, you uh, can figure out and can calculate a theoretical price of what the oil itself should be worth, the crude oil. Uh, 
Now, some products have more energy per liter and they're less polluting than other products, and so they're more valuable. Also, some are easier to refine. Some oils are easier to refine. Oil that can be refined at the higher price products, uh, such as jet fuel or gasoline, is worth more than oil that's only good for making cheaper products, such as bunker fuel. That's a very dirty, highly polluting fuel that's used on ships, or asphalt, the stuff that goes onto your roads. Now, the main terms for describing oil are, believe it or not, sweet and sour. Uh, that refers to the amount of sulfur in the oil. This term really does refer to the taste of the oil. In the 19th century, oil prospectors would taste and smell it to determine its quality. Oil can also be described as light or heavy. Now, the exact definitions of light or heavy vary among uh, various countries, but basically it, it, they're based on measures such as how easily it flows and how dense the oil is compared to water. So light, sweet crudes can be processed with less sophisticated and energy intensive refineries, and they can be made into cleaner, more energy intensive products than the heavy sour crudes. So the light sweet crudes are usually more expensive than the heavy sour crudes. And you can see here in this graph how the different kinds of crude, ra crude rank in terms of heavy versus light on the x-axis and sweet and sour on the y-axis. So the very light sweet crudes, which would be in the lower right-hand corner of the, uh, the, this graph, would be more expensive than the uh, heavy sour crudes, which would be in the upper left-hand corner. The Mexican Maya crude would be a low-quality crude, while the Malaysian tapas or Algeria Sahara would be the um, very expensive crude. Now, because the, the quality of crude varies so much from place to place, the price is usually set in reference to a benchmark. That is, a few crudes uh, trade in the open market and a public price is established for them then other crudes are priced at a premium or discount to those crudes, and that premium or discount doesn't change as much. So how do you identify the crudes? Um, the oil field, each oil field has a name usually, and the oil that each field produces is named after the field it comes from. So the two main benchmark crudes in the world are West Texas Intermediate, or WTI in the US and Brent in Europe. There are other benchmarks too, such as Dubai crude, Oman crude, and the OPEC reference basket, but these aren't traded as actively, and so they're not used that much for speculation among the general populace. Uh, WTI, uh, West Texas Intermediate, is a blend of several oils from West Texas, of course, while well, Brent comes from various fields in the North Sea, offshore Scotland. Originally, uh, Brent just came from the Brent field, but now it's more of a trading classification uh, comprising several, a blend of several oils. The name Brent, by the way, came from uh, the naming policy of shell oil, which used to name all its fields after birds. In this case, it's the Brent goose. WTI is used as the main benchmark for U.S. oil, while Brent's used for pricing oil produced in Europe, Africa, and parts of the Middle East. Both of them. WTI and Brent are light sweet crudes. WTI is a bit lighter and sweeter than Brent, and so historically was a bit more expensive. Although in recent years, the supply of WTI has increased a lot, uh, so that's pushed its price down below Brent. There are a lot of investors actually who trade the difference between the two oils rather than taking a view on the direction of oil it, itself. Uh, but, uh, that, but that's the subject for another webinar. Now, if you actually want to buy some oil, you know, if you want to go buy a barrel of oil and take it home with you, you'd be interested in what's called the spot price. That's the price uh, you might see quoted in the paper for oil. It's the price of oil for immediate delivery, like to buy it today or anytime out to about 30 days. The spot market is generally conducted over the phone and over the counter market and the uh, news agencies, etc., collect prices and publish them at the end of each day. However, that's not the price that people like us who are just interested in trading oil use. FX Primus offers contracts based on the WTI and Brent futures prices. That's because futures are listed on exchange and they're constantly traded. 
you can get a two-way price in uh, these contracts around the clock. So you can buy or sell much more easily. Also, because as long as you manage your position correctly, you won't have to worry about where to put the oil. You'll never get it. Uh, trading in WTI and Brent futures is pretty similar. The volume and open interest on both exchanges is pretty similar. So I don't think there's any big advantage to trading one market over the other. And they both run 24 hours a day. Since we use the nearest contract, uh, the one that's going to mature earliest, uh, the difference between the spot price that you might read in the paper and the futures price isn't that great. Now, futures do have one disadvantage, which is that eventually the contract matures. Uh, for example, the near contract in WTI expires on September 20th. So if you want to buy oil and hold it longer than September 20th or past September 20th, you'd have to close out your position and open a new one. That would usually entail a loss because longer dated contracts tend to have higher, under normal circumstances, would have a higher price than shorter dated contracts. To get around that problem, we also offer a contract based on the futures that doesn't mature. Now, sometimes this kind of contract is referred to as spot, but that's simply wrong. That's not what it's called in the oil industry. So, what moves the oil price? What do you have to watch out for? And I'd like to get into, this is uh, the nitty gritty of, well, what we're interested in here. The price of oil, like most other freely traded products, is set by supply and demand, of course. It's supposedly very simple. More buyers than sellers, the price goes up. More sellers than buyers, the price goes down. That's the basis of all markets, isn't it? Okay, but why are people buying or selling? That's a bit more complicated. The supply of oil is, of course, determined by how much oil can be pumped at any given time. Uh, the factors that determine demand extend, on the other hand, extend far beyond just how many people are driving to work every day. So we're gonna look at supply first. Now, until recently, the supply of oil was pretty steady in the short term. It takes a long time to find and to develop an oil field. Once the oil wells were pumping, uh, usually pr producer preferred to pump all the oil they could because they've spent a lot of money to find the oil, drill the well, and blah, 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 and it costs money to turn it off too. So until recently, the majority of short-term changes in output, short-term changes in output were disruptions that caused a reduction in supply. It's very hard to have a sudden increase in supply, but you could have a sudden decrease in supply. Now, what kind of what what are these disrupt disruptions? Well, loading terminals break down, power outages, slow production, thieves damage pipelines, bad weather shuts down offshore oil rigs, terrorists attack oil wells and pipelines. Iran was shut out of the global oil markets for years because of sanctions. Libya's oil production, uh, you know, they had a civil war there, and sometimes producers just shut down their operations for maintenance. Also, oil fields get exhausted over time. For example, uh, you know, they pump the oil out and eventually there's no oil left. Uh, so uh, Britain's North Sea oil fields, for example, made the country a net exporter in the 1980s, but now Britain's a net importer of oil. So reductions in supply naturally tend to push up the price. Okay, so that's, that's what could cause a sudden reduction in supply, what could cause a sudden increase in supply? Uh, historically, that came from only a few places. First off, of course, when the obstacles or disruptions that cause a decrease in supply end, supply naturally would come back to the old levels, and so you'd get a sudden increase. That's the easiest thing. Uh, for example, right, oil prices went down recently because there were fires in Canada that shut down Canadian production and uh, some people were attacking the pipelines in Nigeria. But the Canadian fires are out, and so Canada's back online, and uh, they've managed to deal with the, the problem, the terrorist problem in Nigeria. So Nigeria is pumping more oil. But there's also another way that prices, supply could increase, and this is very crucial. Some countries, in particular Saudi Arabia, kept some supply capacity in reserve. Saudi Arabia did this in order to retain its role as what's called the swing producer, the swing producer within OPEC, the organization of the petroleum exporting countries. And in fact, it was the swing producer within the world oil market. 
That is, so what's a swing producer? When demand increased and prices rose, Saudi Arabia had some spare capacity that it wasn't using, some oil wells that were ready to pump but weren't pumping. And it would raise its production in order to bring supply and demand back into balance and keep prices from rising too far. On the other hand, when demand weakened and prices fell, the very rich Saudi kingdom would reduce its output uh, to shore up prices to keep them from, from pricing uh, falling too low. The reason was that Saudi Arabia, with its huge reserves of oil, wanted to keep oil prices low enough that the global economy would re remain healthy and so that it wasn't uh, economic to produce alternative sources of energy. But it also wanted to keep prices high enough to maximize revenues over the long term. This was the historic way that the oil market ran and until about 2008, 2009. However, fracking and horizontal drilling changed everything. The oil world has changed very much because of the development of, the, of hydraulic fracturing or fracking and horizontal drilling. Fracking is a technique where the end of the inject, the drillers inject liquids into the oil wells at high pressure. This fractures the rocks and releases the oil and natural gas. Actually, fracking isn't that new, but it just wasn't widely used before. However, it came into fashion recently uh, with new technology that enabled operators to drill wells horizontally. And this has enabled producers to access oil that they never could have accessed before. So looking at these pictures on, on the web, as you can see on the left, a typical vertical well will intersect the oil deposit over really only a very small part of its length. So that not that much oil, or the, the rate at which the oil seeps into the well isn't that great. But a horizontal well has much more oil, much more surface exposed to the oil deposit, and so it produces a lot more oil. Although, as a result, it will also exhaust the oil deposit more quickly. Now the picture on the right shows how much more you will get if you fracture the rocks. So even in that case, even more oil flows into the well. You get more oil out of there more quickly, but of course you exhaust the well even faster. The result of this has just been stunning. Uh, it's boost US and, and Canadian oil production by about 80% over the last few years from 8 million barrels a day to 15 million barrels a day. And it's turned North America into the world's largest oil producer. North America, US and Canada produce about 40% as much as all the OPEC countries combined. So this has eroded the power of OPEC and Saudi Arabia to control the supply of oil and therefore control the price of oil. I'd like to add that just from a personal point of view, it's also created a nightmare for a lot of US residents. Uh, fracking causes earthquakes, and it occasionally forces natural gas into the water supply. And you get people getting get these flames shooting out from their water faucets. It's a, yeah, but that's a different story. Now, fracking is qualitatively different from pre previous methods of drilling for oil, and it's really changed the nature of the oil industry. Previous methods of oil, uh, producing were very heavily capital intensive. It took a long, a long time and a lot of money to develop a an oil well. Fracking wells, on the other hand, are a lot cheaper. They're faster and they're easier to turn on and off. They've turned oil production into almost an assembly line process and there's been a really great increase in the efficiency of producing oil now. This has changed the elasticity of supply for oil. Traditionally, as I said, it took a lot of money to start an oil well, and so the producers didn't want to turn them off even if the price fell, since the marginal cost of pumping the oil once you developed it was relatively low. Fracked wells, on the other hand, are cheaper to start, but apparently they cost more to maintain, so their owners are more willing to turn them off when prices fall. So the supply of oil now or reacts much more quickly to the demand than it used to. In addition, uh, this is an unusual point, 
fracking and horizontal drilling has given rise to a large number of drilled uncompleted wells. These are duck wells, D-U-C wells. These are wells that have been started. Uh, they've started drilling them, but they haven't completed them. They can be brought into onto production within four or five months if the drilling well company believes it would be economical to do so. So right now, from what I, I gather, there are something like 4,000 of these duck wells in the US. So <laughs> they represent a potential 1 million barrels a, a day of oil production that in theory could be brought onto stream relatively quickly. Of course, quite theoretical as they couldn't all be, you know, they just aren't the people and equipment to start all of them at the same time. But what it means is when the price goes up, the supply responds much more quickly than it used to in the past. Now, market participants monitor this the supply of duck wells, which is called the frack log, the fracking plus backlog, to anticipate possible near-term increases in output when the price starts to go up. So uh, the increase in supply from fracking in the East is one of the major factors that has pushed oil prices down, especially over the last year or so. Uh, fracking changed the nature of the oil market in another important way by making oil production sensitive to the financial cycle. Uh, the big oil companies really are ca independent of the banks. They finance everything out of their cash flow. But now you've got a lot of these small companies that need bank loans in order to operate. Uh, so the supply of oil, at least in the U.S., has become responsive to credit conditions, an entirely new development for the oil market. So that's why earlier in the year, when it looked like a lot of banks in America were pulling back loans from, from oil companies, it was very negative for the future supply of oil. The price goes up, though, the, bank, the companies become more um, credit worthy, the banks lend them the money, and supply increases. Now, perhaps most importantly, uh, this increase in supply in the US which is not a member of OPEC, has eroded or even destroyed the importance of OPEC in stabilizing the market. It's increased the amount of oil that non-OPEC producers and made the US, the US, not Saudi Arabia, act as the world's swing producer. So that's the supply side of the oil market. Now let's discuss the, uh, the demand side. What moves demand? Well, oil usage is very seasonal. Um, in the summer, people go on vacation and they drive a lot more, especially in the summer. In the winter, people have to heat their homes. That's a big user use of oil. This causes a stocking and destocking cycle for oil. Refiners build up inventories of gasoline in the spring in order to um, supply it, have the gasoline available when people start driving a lot. And then they build up supply of heating oil in the fall. Uh, so they have that on store hand too. So this not only causes a change in the price of oil in general, it causes changes in the relative prices of oil because the light sweet crudes are better for refining into gasoline, heavy sour crudes can be used to make heating oil. So naturally, any disruptions to the usual, usual seasonal patterns will cause a disruption to the usual pattern of, of oil consumption. For example, unusually warm weather can cut into demand for oil in the winter while in unusually hot weather in the summer increases demand for air conditioning, which increases demand for electricity, which increases demand for oil to supply electric generators. So weather reports, weather reports are required reading for the aspiring oil trader. Uh, oil demand also varies with economic growth. Uh, and when uh, the economy is booming, industry uses more energy to produce more goods. Railroads, uh, trucks, and ships use more oil to move these goods, and people tend to drive more. Recessions, however, it all goes into reverse, and oil usage falls. You can see in this graph how oil tends to use. This graph show, uh, shows the uh, the oh, the uh, year on year on year increase, year on year change in oil prices. The line. And the shaded areas are the, um, the periods of recession. You can see how oil use tends to fall during recessions, the gray areas, and it 
tends to increase during expansions, the, the white areas. This is why oil prices respond to indicators of overall economic conditions, such as the uh, GDP figures, the purchasing managers indices, uh, consumer sentiment, retail sales, etc. Similarly, economic developments caused a large increase in demand for oil over time because people with higher income uh, and a higher standard of living tend to use more energy up to a point. For example, China makes around 24 million cars and trucks a year. This is about five times what it produced 10 years ago and you know, 20 or 30 years ago, they, almost, they made almost nothing. China makes double, about double the vehicles that the US makes. So obviously there's been a huge increase in demand for gasoline in China to run all these cars. That's an example of how the uh, increase, the improvement in living standards and rise in general development increases demand for energy. On the other hand, uh, it's a very interesting point, which is hard to quantify. Technology is starting to make inroads into oil demand in the developed countries. For example, I mean, the most obvious one is using solar power instead of, instead of oil to generate electricity. But also, internet shopping has reduced the amount of driving people do. Even things like Netflix reduce the amounts of driving people do to go out to, uh, to the movies. So while technological progress in developing countries often means greater use of energy and more demand for oil, in developed countries, it can have the opposite effect. So uh, this, uh, here we've got a table that shows the major oil consuming countries. Note that you, the US, Europe, and China account for 48% of world oil use which is why the oil market is particularly sensitive to indicators of growth in these three countries or regions. Adding Japan on, it's half the world's oil. Uh, Russia, Brazil, and Saudi Arabia are large consumers of oil, but they're also large uh, producers of oil. So their activity doesn't make such a big difference unless their domestic consumption gets to be so big that they have to divert oil away from exports to domestic use. Now, Overall, about uh, the oil prices, what I should say is that they are mean reverting over time, although it takes, it takes some time. What they say in the oil, price, oil business is high prices cure high prices and low prices cure low prices. What that means is when prices rise uh, to reach a certain level, supply increases and demand decreases. Because you know, if it's prices are that high, it becomes more economic to develop certain wells. And when prices are that high, people just don't drive as much. So supply increases, demand decreases, and the price comes back down. On the other hand, when prices fall, uh, oil producers pump less oil and because they don't want to sell it at that price. And consumers start to use more oil. They drive more, and that starts to push prices back up. So high prices cure high prices and low prices cure low prices. Now, how do we judge the supply demand balance in oil? It's really hard to see supply uh, on a up-to-date basis. It's really hard, almost impossible to judge demand on a high, on an up-to-date basis, but you can see the, uh, the balance between the two by looking at the change in inventories. Uh, if you think of inventories, the inventory of oil, the supply, in, a, in effect, you've got, let's say, the world supply of oil is a big oil tank. In effect, the supply of oil goes in the top of the tank, and that's the supply. Uh, the demand for oil, uh, they pull oil out of the bottom of the tank. tank. That's demand. You can't judge, you, it's very hard to judge the supply coming from all over the world. You can't get accurate up-to-date data on that on a timely basis. Uh, you can't necessarily judge the demand either, but you can measure the oil in the tank. So if the amount of oil in the tank rises, then supply is exceeding demand. And on the other hand, if the amount of oil in the tank is falling, then demand exceeds supply. This is why the weekly inventory figures from the American Petroleum Institute, the API, 
and the US Department of Energy. They're the Energy Information Agency, the EIA, are very closely watched. Uh, as the table I showed before showed this here, we've got the US accounts for around 20% of world oil consumption. So its supply and demand for oil is really the single most important factor in determining the price. Now, since these, uh, the API report and the EIA report are the most important high frequency news to affect the oil market, um, I'm gonna spend some time discussing them and the difference between the two reports. First, the weekly API report. This is the American Petroleum Institute, a national trade association for companies that produce, refine, or distribute oil and oil products. This, uh, the API produces a weekly statistical bulletin, uh, which reports on oil production and the production of the five most important petroleum products. Uh, they account for more than 80% of total refinery production. Uh, it also includes information on inventories. They publish it every Friday, Tuesday afternoon, uh, and, time, and it refers to the weekend of the previous Friday. One key point, the report's available by subscription only so the numbers aren't widely distributed to the general public, but everybody in the oil business subscribes, so they do move markets. Now, this is a copy of the report, uh, the circled figure down below, the change in crude oil stocks is the most important number. Secondly, here's the Depart Department of Energy report. Uh, this, this is uh, yeah, the US Department of Energy, a cabinet level office, Within the Department of Energy, they have the Energy Information Administration, their statistical and analytical agency. They publish the EIA Weekly Petroleum Status Report. Uh, this gives information about the supply of oil, both imported and domestic, and the level, in, level of inventories of crude oil and refined products. This is published every Wednesday, the day after the API report, but it covers the same time period as the API. Now, this is the is the EIA report uh, for the same week that, that uh, I showed you the API report. And uh, again, here we look, the main thing is the change in crude oil inventories that everybody looks at. So in both reports, they're focused on the change in inventories from the previous week. A negative figure shows a drawdown in inventories, which suggests that demand exceeds supply. As a result, prices often move higher. Yesterday, the API announced a, um, a 6.2 million barrel drawdown in inventories, much bigger than expected. Oil prices were up 2%. Uh, on the other hand, an increase in inventories would tend to push prices lower. Notice here that it also says the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is the US government holdings of oil, but people just ignore that. It's doesn't, uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the underlying demand. So in this report, we got the a EIA said 7.4 million barrels, the API said 7.2 million. Uh, it's pretty close together, pretty close, but not the same. Why aren't the two the same? Uh, the, they both use the same definitions and cover the same time period. Uh, the API comes out, as I said, a day earlier, but it only covers its 550 me members and other companies who agree to report to it anyway. On the other hand, by law, all oil companies have to report their information to the EIA. So the API reports a day earlier, but the EIA report is, in theory at least, more complete. Uh, there are other differences. Some of the differences also arise because the, the API sometimes rejects data if it might, they think it might be accurate. Also, the two organizations have different statistical methodologies for estimating data from firms that don't respond. Uh, in any event, I think the market responds more to, the market reacts more to the EIA data because A, it's perceived as being more accurate, and B, since it's publicly available, many security firms produce forecasts for it, and that produces a market consensus to judge the figures against. Although, of course, uh, traders' views on the market consensus may change Tuesday afternoon after they see the API figure. The EIA data also includes initial estimates for U.S. oil production. More accurate figures are available sometime later when the monthly numbers come out. This is very important. Uh, I'll discuss it later. Now, the API and EIA figures usually match in direction, but not necessarily in the magnitude. Um, 
they they're the same direction about 86 and from 2015 until March they were the same direction 86 percent of the time uh, so once every seven weeks more or less they were different but for magnitude the two differed by over a million barrels 60 percent of the time and by over three million barrels 24 percent of the time so you can't exactly so there can be a big difference there now, how do these figures affect the oil market? Here we can see the change in the EIA crude inventories. Uh, that's the black line reversed and the blue line reversed versus the change in w the WTI price. Uh, as you can see, when inventories are increasing, WTI prices tend to decline, decline and vice versa. That's because rising inventories show supply exceeding demand uh, the season now the seasonal nature of the market means that inventories have to be evaluated in relation to the average inventories for that time of year so usually investors compare the current level of inventories to the average for that week for the last five years or so and that's what I've got a graph of here where the orange part is the normal range for the week over the previous five years and the blue line is current inventories. You can see how much in how inventories are wildly higher than they than would be normal, and they have been for the last year and a half or so. Uh, there's one quirk with the oil uh, inventory figures. Uh, the main loading point for WTI in the U.S. is Cushing, Oklahoma. You can hear it, see, see it on this map here, which shows the major oil pipelines in North America. Cushing is the place with the white arrow pointing at it. Now, the inventories at Cushing are closely watched because, uh, apart from the national inventory figures, because there's just limited storage space in Cushing, and uh, they're getting pretty full. They're now about 70 million barrels, and uh, Cushing can hold about 85 million barrels. So the price of WTI can sometimes fall independently of the overall supply demand picture if it looks like there isn't enough storage space in Cushing anymore. Now, oil can also be stored offshore in tankers, which makes the price of chartering tankers an indication in the oil market. And if you get really into things, you, there's uh, oil storage futures too, if you ever get want to for storage in Louisiana. Now, what else do people watch for the oil market? Every week, the Baker Hughes company announces the Baker Hughes rig count. Uh, it comes out Friday evening in the US after Europe and Asia have gone to bed. This is a weekly tally of how many oil and gas rigs um, there are. These are the towers that are used to support the equipment that drills for the oil. How many are in operation in the US and Canada? Data on other countries is available on a monthly basis. The idea is that when the number of rigs increases in a few months, the amount of oil being produced is likely to increase too, and vice versa. For example, the number of rigs in use in the US has collapsed from about 1,600 in uh, October 2004 to only 341 today. That's almost an 80% decline. That's gone along with a 10% decline in the amount of oil produced. Historically, the number of rigs led output by around 18 months, as you can see in this graph here, where the orange line is the number of rigs and uh, the blue line is the number of oil, the amount of oil produced. However, the um, improving technology has enabled drillers to get dr to drill more wells with one rig and to get more oil out of each well. So, the amount of oil and the number of rigs is less closely correlated than before. So some other things that move the market, um, the weekly inventory figures that the IEA publishes are preliminary figures, as I mentioned. About two months after the fact, they also publish a monthly figure, it's thought to be more accurate. These aren't as market affecting, but they can have significant information. Other regular news items uh, are the International Energy Agency monthly report and the OPEC monthly report on oil. Both of these contain forecasts for supply and demand. In particular, changes for the IEA's forecast for global demand can move the market. And that brings us to the next part. I know I said before that the price of oil is determined by supply and demand. Actually, that's wrong. If you just trade on supply and demand, you're likely to lose money. According to researchers at the European economic think tank Bruegel, uh, 
That might have been the case before the financial crisis of 2008, but since then, the factors driving the market have changed dramatically. Nowadays, they estimate supply accounts for only 15% of the change in prices and demand accounts for 12%. The bulk of the change in price of oil, 73%, is due to changes in expectations. Just expectations. Oil is trading like a financial product in which the role of speculators has become dominant, not just traders. Uh, this graph shows their estimate of what moved the oil price with the contribution of expectations in green, changes in supply in blue, and changes in demand in red. So we have to ask what affects the expectations for oil. One of the major points, as I mentioned before, is economic indicators. Uh, market participants form views on future demand for oil by considering what the level of economic activity is likely to be in the future. So this is why oil prices react to GDP, PMI, and this. The weather and other factors, people are wondering about El Nino and stuff like that. But the main thing that we haven't discussed yet is geopolitics, and particularly the geopolitics of the Middle East. Uh, let's face it, a lot of oil is produced in countries that aren't the most stable, Iraq, Libya, and Nigeria, for example. So people are always watching for signs of trouble in those countries that might restrict supply. Here's a graph of where oil is produced around the world. The darker the color, uh, the more oil is produced there. And here's a graph of global instability. The darker the color, the more unstable the country. Do you notice any similarity between these two graphs? Yes, oil tends to be produced in unstable areas. Now, geography plays a large part uh, Many of the large Middle Eastern oil producers, including Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates, can only access the sea through the Persian Gulf, as you can see in this, this, um, this map, uh, or the Arabian Gulf, depending on which side of it you live on. Saudi Arabia's main loading port, Ras Tanura, is also on the, the Gulf side. Now, this narrow gulf is only 56 kilometers wide at its narrowest points, the Straits of Hormuz. And the shipping lane is only 3.2 kilometers wide. This is also the world's largest single source of oil. In 2011, an average of 14 tankers a day carrying some 20% of the world's traded oil sailed through that 3.2 kilometer shipping lane. Uh, that makes it an incredible choke point for oil. Now notice on the north shore of the Gulf is Iran, on the south shore is Saudi Arabia. These two countries are currently at war, basically, or at least proxy war. So hostilities between the two have waxed and waned, and Iran sometimes threatens to block the straits in order to publish its adversaries. This is why one of the main reasons why unrest in the Middle East is so damaging for the oil market. There are other choke points around the region, uh, too. For example, uh, when the Egyptians overthrew President Mubarak in 2011, oil prices shot up out of fear that the Suez Canal would be closed and the oil pipeline that runs along it might be closed. So this is how geopolitics affects it. The point is that it's not necessary for events to cause any disruption in the supply of oil. It's just the threat that they might cause a disruption, and that's enough to send the oil price higher. Oil refiners will rush to buy oil and put it in storage so they'll have enough supplies even if oil becomes unavailable. And others will hedge their risk by buying oil futures, so that will push up current prices too. In short, as traders spec wanting to speculate on the price of oil have to consider all the factors that might possibly at some time in the foreseeable future affect the oil price of oil and they have to trade accordingly. Now, I'd just like to say a word about the connection between the oil market and the FX market. Uh, there's a close connection between the oil market and the FX market. Uh, there are several reasons for this. First off, for some countries, especially Canada, Norway, and Russia, oil is their main export. So when the oil prices change, it has an immediate impact on their terms of trade. The value of the exports is compared to the value of the imports. And that has an immediate impact on their currency. On the other hand, some other countries, particularly the emerging market countries, are net importers of oil. Their terms of trade and their current account balances are affected by the price of oil too, but in the opposite direction, in the opposite way. 
Oil prices tend to move along with economic activity, as I said, and so too does uh, do many currencies. So they can, can some currencies are correlated, therefore correlated with the oil price. Oil prices tend to rise when geopolitical tensions rise, and periods of geopolitical tension tend to be periods of risk aversion, which has uh, implications for currencies. Oil is usually paid for with dollars. As a result, when the price of oil rises, global demand for dollars rises, and the dollar usually benefits. Now, these dollars aren't recycled back to the original countries in the same rate. For example, Eurozone countries have to buy dollars to pay their oil bill with Saudi Arabia, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Saudis will change all those dollars back into euros and spend them in the Eurozone. Rather, they may choose to save some of the money in dollars, and that increases the net demand for dollars. On the other hand, since the oil price is paid with for oil, since oil is paid for with dollars, the price of oil tends to fall when the dollar rises because it's more expensive for countries outside the U.S. to buy oil. Uh, the reverse also happens too. Now, other dollar-denominated co commodities such as gold show this same kind of behavior. The oil market is therefore important for FX investors to watch. And now earlier in the presentation, I showed you a table of currencies that weren't closely correlated with the oil price. This table shows the currencies that are closely correlated with WTI and Brent, including some of the more unusual currency pairs, such as dollar Singapore or uh, dollar, well, dollar South Africa. The South African rand is, as a commodity currency would tend to be highly correlated. But you would notice how the Canadian dollar, Russian ruble, Norwegian krone, Mexican peso, and the Australian dollar are the most closely correlated with oil. Australia is not a particularly big oil export, but it does export coal, and the price of coal depends to some degree on other energy sources. Probably more important, though, is that the Australian economy is closely tied to that of China, and expectations for Chinese economic activity tend to move the oil price. Uh, the yen, on the other hand, tends, seems to weaken when oil prices go up in the cross rates uh, more than like CAD yen and Aussie yen more than in dollar yen or euro yen. Uh, that could be because since the Fukushima disaster, Japan shut down its nuclear power stations and it's had to import large amounts of oil, uh, which reduced its current account surplus. So, sorry, I'm getting on here a bit. Uh, I just want to say a few words about why, where I think the oil price is headed and why I expect oil prices to fall. I've expected it to fall for some time now. Uh, the Brexit uh, event only makes uh, me think more, it's more likely to fall. First off, Brexit increased uncertainty in the world, and that will probably reduce investment. That means less growth, which is negative for oil. Secondly, Brexit's caused a general risk-off mood that's bad for all commodities, except uh, gold and silver, safe haven commodities. Uh, the dollar is rising as a, a result of this event, which is, as I've said, bad for oil. Now, getting back to just the oil fundamentals, with oil prices around $50 a barrel, that's enough for the U.S. shale producers to start pumping oil from the frack log. So I expect the supply of oil to start increasing in the U.S. in the near future. Uh, finally, several of the uh, disturbances that pushed oil prices higher are now over, uh, particularly in Canada and Nigeria, as I mentioned, the Canadian forest fires are out. Nigeria has dealt with uh, its terrorist problem for a little bit. Iran and Saudi Arabia both want to pump more oil, and they are going to work to do so. Finally, I think demand might not be as strong as people think. Uh, while the weekly data shows demand rising, the monthly data, which is more accurate, is headed in the opposite direction. Here we have the U.S. oil demand and U.S. gasoline demand from the uh, U.S. Energy Information Agency. The yellow figures are the four-week moving average of the weekly data, while the blue lines are the monthly data. And you can see that they've started to diverge very much. We only have monthly data up to April, but they've started diverging a lot. And as you can see, normally when they diverge, the weekly data comes into line with the monthly data, not the monthly data coming into line with the weekly data. So that's why I think the oil price is headed lower. Well, I've gone on for a while. Uh, let me open up the uh, 
open up the, the, the uh, discussion to any questions now. See if there are any questions. Okay, well, if there are no questions now, uh, let's see. I just want to say a word about the uh, the uh, a, the tomorrow's uh, non-farm payrolls report. Just uh, I think, given the very, I didn't see what the uh, ADP report. Oh yes, the ADP report was around 173. It was very strong. Uh, based on my estimates for what I think the non-farm payroll should be around 176,000 according to my very rough estimate. New re research by the San Francisco Fed suggests May hiring was actually much higher than the figure is. It should be revised up. Uh, I expect the non-farm payrolls to be relatively robust and for that to help the dollar. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for attending this webinar. and. Hope that, uh, that if you have any questions, please send them to me at marshallgittler at fxprimus.com. Thank you very much.